Good morning. Um, I'm Peter Godwin. Um, I've got three pieces of bad news I just want to get out of the way at the top. The one is that I tried to donate my 10 minutes to KS Rhodes, but uh, Thor said I couldn't. The second is that I have no pictures at all. Um, I'm a writer, and uh, so I deal in words. And the third is that I'm a, a white African. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm a white man talking about Africa, which can sometimes be awkward. Uh, I come from a tribe of oxymorons, the white Africans, and our southern compatriots, our Afrikaans-speaking compatriots, they talk about, um, they talk about English-speaking Africans uh, and that in a derogatory way. They have a special name for us. They call us soat peels. Um, and for all of those of you who speak Afrikaans, a soat peel uh, in Afrikaans means a salt penis. And they call us this because they say we have one foot in Africa and one in either Europe or, in my case, America, and our genitals dangle in the ocean where they marinate. Um, so that's one of the many burdens we have on our identity, a much hyphenated identity, but there we are. Um, worse than that, we are also visual reminders of a colonial era. Nevertheless, uh, I'm from Zimbabwe, and it's something that in all honesty, I've tried to walk away from many times, and although I no longer live in Zimbabwe and haven't for some time, and I haven't been able to, um, I have ended up uh, writing books about Zimbabwe and trying to amplify uh, their plight. And their plight is very simple, really. Um, their plight is that they have been trying, uh, they've been struggling for democracy for more than 30 years now. At the moment, there's a strange uh, revisionism occurring about Robert Mugabe, the leader of Zimbabwe, who has been the president of Zimbabwe for 33 years, and he is now closing in on 90 years old himself. Um, and there have been a number of articles recently that I've read saying that uh, maybe it's time to rehabilitate Mugabe, maybe that he is actually uh, part, part of the solution um, for Zimbabwe. Uh, and this disturbs me. As Zimbabwe faces new elections sometime later this year, um, probably in July or August, I want to take you briefly with me back to the last elections so you can understand what elections mean in a country like Zimbabwe. And it's one of the special things about this kind of event that puts together a number of us from different parts of the world, and in all honesty makes us realize that we're not alone, that we have such parallel experiences. I sat here yesterday listening, for example, to what had happened in Malaysia and recognizing tactic after tactic after tactic. Venezuela the same. There are so many different countries um, which when one gets the shock of, of recognition. I want to take you back to the elections in 2008. I went back with my sister, snuck into the country, and the first, th there, was a f there was a first round of elections which the government uh, miscalculated the strength of the opposition, and it went to a second round. And in that period of time, we were driving back from our childhood, uh, our childhood home on the Mozambique border, and we started to see in the gloaming, in twilight, people being pushed in wheelbarrows along the side of the road in paths, jungle paths, or on carts. And we commented at the time that hyperinflation had got so bad in Zimbabwe and fuel rationing was, there was almost no fuel, that people were, this is how they had to travel. At the time, you'll bear in mind that Zimbabwe had the highest hyperinflation in, in, in history, I believe. The, the Zimbabwe dollar was halving in value every 24 hours. And when we got back to the capital, we realized that what we were seeing was the beginning of a campaign of torture. And I want to take you with me into the Avenues Clinic, where I was snuck in by a, a nurse, uh, a very a tough nurse, the sort of sergeant major of the wards, who normally was rather unemotional. And there were torture victims in every single bed of this large hospital and lying on the floor, 
uh, and um, in wheelchairs in every nook and cranny. And I spoke to the doctor and he said, he, he used this chilling phrase, he said, they've all got defense injuries. And I said, well, what, what are defense injuries? And he said, well, defense injuries are the injuries caused when you put your arms up like this to try and ward off blows, the blows of the log, the blows of the whip, the blows of barbed wire, the blows of rocks, the blows of the machete, the blows of the axe. And as a result, they have, I mean, to call them fractures is really not, not doesn't really cover what they had, really grotesque uh, injuries on their, on their arms. And you went to bed after bed after bed, and that is what you saw. And the orthopedic surgeon was almost in tears because he had run out of pins and plates that you needed to fix these things. Um, so they were sitting there, and they were unable to be repaired. And if fractures were repairing, they were they were distorted and he would have to break them again when he finally got the pins um, and the plates. And there was a woman in there who had her arms terribly broken and the nurses were bringing to her her tiny baby and she couldn't hold the baby to her breast to feed it and they were trying to help it to feed. And the nurse I saw, this nurse, very tough nurse actually, sort of pretending to clean her glasses so she wouldn't appear to be crying. And what we were seeing was really torture on an industrial scale. Um, it was a production line, and they were doing it in schools. Um, the schools had effectively been abandoned. Education had pretty much stopped. And what they were doing was picking up opposition supporters, running them through these torture bases where they would beat them terribly and torture them. But the, the orders were to do it just this side of death, not to kill people. They overstepped on a number of occasions and, and, and did kill several hundred people, but that's not what they were doing. What they were trying to do was they would torture them for a few days on what that, the term that was described to me, that angler's term, catch and release, that they would torture them and then they would let them go. And they would become human billboards, in effect. They would, they would be advertisements for what happened to you if you opposed the government. When they went back to their home villages, they would set off a ripple of fear and anxiety. Uh, there was even a name for this operation. They called it, the government called it Operation Ngati Pedze Navo, which means to finish them off. The victims called it simply Chidudu, which means the fear. What's important to understand about a regime like Robert Mugabe's regime, especially now that people are talking about trying to rehabilitate him, is that violence has always been his modus operandi. He has been, there's one thing you can't fail him on, he has been utterly consistent. It's actually us that have changed. The world has changed around him, but he has been frighteningly consistent. And if I just take you back briefly, look at his, um, his history. He starts off in the guerrilla war, radicalized by recalcitrant white rule, and there's a guerrilla war, justified insofar as white rule won't go voluntarily. And it works. In 1980, there are the first um, post-racial elections in Zimbabwe. And what's supposed to happen is that everybody, uh, it's that the, the elections are demilitarized. And what Mugabe did, in fact, was leave his guerrillas out in the field. And they went around saying to the people, listen, vote for us or a luta continua. The struggle continues. The war goes on. And they won those elections, as they probably would have done anyway. But it shows you very early on that this is a man who's actually much more interested in power than in democracy. And occasionally these two things can go together. Democracy can in fact deliver power. But here, what he was really interested in was power. A few years later, he sends his North Korean trained troops down into the south of the country and they carry out a massacre, a sustained massacre, called Gukura Hundi, another operation, which is designed to break the opposition in the south. Owen Maseko, a Zimbabwean artist, will talk about this later today, and I urge you to, to, to listen to, to his story. Gokura Hundi, we reckon, we don't know, that probably a minimum of 20,000 civilians were killed, maybe many times that number, never been investigated, no one's been prosecuted. After that, there's effectively a one-party state, and then the elections that happen subsequently are, are full of rigging and intimidation. And as Stalin is once alleged to have said, although he didn't have much experience in elections himself, that it's, um, it's not um, who votes that counts, it's, it's the people who count it. That, that it's not the, <laughs> sorry, that the people who count are the people who matter, not the people who vote. It's the people who count the votes that matter. Um, 
but there's been very little international reaction to what's happened in Zimbabwe over the years. Zimbabwe lacks the two main, the two vital exports that get you international intervention. And those exports, those exports are oil and terrorism. And it doesn't export either of those, so it's not considered vital. Um, the, the thing that the West leaves, the, the West has basically left Zimbabwe over to South Africa. President Bush, when he was in power, famously said that Thabo Mbeki, the then Southern African, uh, South African president, was his point man on Zimbabwe. And the problem with that is that if you look throughout Southern Africa, what you see is that all the liberation uh, war regimes, the governments that came into power after anti-colonial struggles, are all still in power. Not a single one has, has, has left power. So you've got Frelimo in Mozambique, ANC in South Africa, SWAPO in Namibia, the MPLA in Angola, the um, ZANU-PF in, in Zimbabwe. And it's not in the interests of any one of them that any of the others lose power. There's something about coming to power uh, in a after a revolution or, or, or a, a war like that, a war of liberation, that kind of mythologizes power. There's a kind of sanctity about it. You go to Zimbabwe, it's a bit like going to Cuba, that you feel like the war happened the day before yesterday. It's kind of mythologized to that extent. It's, it's holy water that you can sprinkle around. Uh, so it's, this struggle in Zimbabwe has been going on for a very long time. And Whenever I feel dispirited about it, which is often, and I've tried to walk away from it many, many times, I think of one person that I met, Chenjerai Mangezo, who was a simple farmer in um, about 30, 40 miles out of Harare, and he decided that he would stand for the opposition in local elections in 2008. And uh, in the middle of the night, 200 militia men came, uh, attacked his house. He told his wife and daughter to hide under the bed while he went out and deliberately distracted them. They followed him down a hill and rained rocks and spears and things, and eventually he was felled, and he was lying in the grass. And I was interviewing him, and he was telling me this story, and uh, this was about a year later. And they were all round him with holding logs and things. And he said, and he, he said, he turned up and he said to them, you better kill me, because if you don't, I know who you are, and I'm going to come and get you. And I put the notebook down and said, why would you do that? Why, were these 200 people like, seriously, why, why would you do that? Why didn't you say, oh, I've seen the error of my ways? And, you know, I mean, just, and he looked at me as though I was the mad one. And he said, why? He said, because it's true. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.